Good evening, everyone. My name is Keegan Chetwind. I'm the director of the Military Aviation Museum, and you are joining us for another one of our Wednesday webinars. This ongoing series of free events is designed as a way to give you all the opportunity to stay connected in this uh, crazy summertime uh, of the coronavirus pandemic. My guest tonight is John Bernstein, who is going to talk to us about one of the most requested airplanes in the collection here at the museum, the P-47 Thunderbolt. We don't have one, uh, but people are always curious to find out if we're working on getting one or when they might be able to come and see one here at the museum. And unfortunately, we're not going to answer that question this evening, except to say that it is something I think we'd all like to see here at the Military Aviation Museum. Um, our speaker tonight is, is John Bernstein. Uh, he's the curator of arms and armor at the National Museum of the Marine Corps, and he's actually a new addition to Virginia. He's just recently taken up this post. Um, previously, he was the director of, Air, of the Air Defense Artillery Museum at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. Uh, he was actually in the midst of his move while we reached out to him to see if he would talk with us tonight about the P-47. Um, and the P-47 really is a passion project for John. You can see see behind him there. He is uh, building a P-47 cockpit of his very own. He will have slides for us tonight as well as keeping his webcam on uh, so that you guys can kind of get a closer look at that cockpit. Uh, John is currently working on his third P-47 book and this one's going to be for Osprey's Duel series which pits the iconic Thunderbolt against German light and medium flak. Not against another airplane per se but against a fairly effective uh, ground defense weapon that was used against P-47s regularly in Europe. So that's probably about enough from me. Um, I will join you all again in the Q&A portion. John, can you can you hear us? You sure can. Well, why don't you uh, take us away? Take us on this incredible journey that is the uh, the multi-theater spanning service of the, the Thunderbolt. Awesome. Thanks very much, Keegan. Uh, great to be here and uh, great to be back on the East Coast. I was... Uh, I'm New Yorker, born and raised, uh, been out in Oklahoma for the past eight years and uh, just moved back this past month. Um, so, uh, as Keegan said, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of my favorite things, uh, P-47. Um, and we'll give basically a, a rundown on how it was, uh, was envisioned, how it came to be, and how it came to be the most produced uh, fighter of World War II, American fighter of World War II. Um, and just uh, we'll go through its, its whole evolution. Um, it, amusingly, it started off as a lightweight fighter design um, and ended up becoming the heaviest fighter of World War II, in fact, the heaviest piston engine fighter of all time. Um, it also began the war as a high altitude interceptor and ended the war as a low to medium altitude fighter bomb. Um, so uh, really runs the gamut of, of missions and mission profiles. Uh, that were, were flown during World War II. Uh, it was produced by the uh, Republic Aircraft Corporation, and it was uh, designed by Alexander Cardvelli, who uh, himself was a Georgian immigrant, um, and he loved to design beautiful airplanes. Uh, the first one, uh, first major uh, design that, that uh, he came up with that was adopted by the Army Air Corps was the P-35, uh, which uh, was adopted in the late 1930s, or mid-1930s. Mid uh, the Army bought 196 of them, and uh, it was the first all-metal monoplane fighter used by the U.S. Army, uh, or the Army Air Corps, I should say. Um, and it was, it was an adequate airplane. Uh, it was relatively fast, fairly maneuverable, uh, had a good range, good, good service ceiling, um, but technology was advancing at such a, a, a pace um, that it was obsolete fairly quickly. Um, now, the, uh, that doesn't mean it didn't soldier on uh, in Army Air Force service, because some actually did see combat in the Philippines in the beginning of World War II. Um, but the uh, other airplane you can see here in the lower right, uh, the XP-41, was supposed to be the follow-on to it and, and featured an improved uh, set of attractive landing gear, um, Better engine, better performance, but really the uh, the rest of, of uh, the uh, aviation industry had already surpassed that. So there was only one XP-41 built. Uh, the next design that Cartvelli came up with was the P-43, and this was really the first um, real uh, excellent uh, high altitude fighter that uh, that the Army Air Corps um, adopted. Um, 
Unfortunately, because of the timing and, and because we were just starting to gear up for World War II, it never really um, hit its stride. But we did export a number of them, and uh, a lot of them went to China. Uh, out of the 272, I think over half of them went to China uh, in, in uh, 1939, 1940. Um, the P-43 itself was... Uh, was an exceptional high altitude airplane. Uh, it could fly higher than just about anything else we had. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was the only one that could actually get up to the altitude where the Japanese KI-46 uh, reconnaissance airplanes operate. Uh, similarly, uh, it could get up to the altitude uh, altitudes in, in Europe where the German Ju-86 would operate. Um, and in fact, uh, in Colonel Robert Scott's book, my, God is My Co-Pilot, he talks about a mission that he flew over Mount Everest and looking down on it from 44,000 feet, which in 1943 was just an unheard of, or excuse me, 1942 was an unheard of altitude. Um, so the, uh, the P-43 was, was a good little airplane, uh, but it had a number of issues. Uh, it was underpowered, so it could climb high, but it couldn't really climb all that fast. Um, and it, was all, it didn't have armor, didn't really have uh, self-sealing fuel tanks. So as a combat airplane, really, there were some drawbacks to it. Um, and Hart Valley knew this and redesigned the, uh, the airplane again and came up with the idea of the XP-44. Uh, the rocket was, was his beautiful design that, that uh, he lamented to his death uh, that this airplane was not, uh, was not built uh, because it was supposed to be streamlined, even though it used a radial engine, um, and fast and, and maneuverable, um, and he really uh, put a lot of his, his faith into, into this design, and the Army Air Corps didn't want it. Uh, the R-2180 engine that he envisioned for it was not a standard engine for the Army Air Corps, and adding one more power plant to the, uh, to the stable really was not viable for logistics of maintaining uh, a fighter force within the Army Air Corps. Uh, they had started to build the prototype in 1940, uh, but a number of things really started to change uh, the way that the Army Air Corps was looking at, at airplanes uh, and, and fi the fighter force in general. And so they had more of an interest in a different design, uh, the XP-47. Now, the XP-47 started off, like I said, as a lightweight high-altitude intercept. And these are a number of designs uh, that uh, Cart Bailey came up with to, to work on cooling uh, the engine at, uh, at high altitude. Uh, now, a number of uh, designs here look like, especially this one here at the, at the bottom in the center, look like the P-40. Uh, and it's because it was supposed to have the Allison B-1710 engine. Uh, yeah, the, it's kind of strange how it went from the Allison engine, which powered the P-39, the P-40, P-38, uh, and eventually ended up with the uh, with the R-2800. Uh, the center design here, you can see, though, it's starting to look a little bit like a P-47. You've got you know, your, your razor back here, and then if you look on the underside, you can see the, this large scoop here uh, for ram air for the, for the uh, turbochargers. Um, that would eventually be, uh, be redesigned to move all the way forward and then incorporate the big R2800 engine uh, in the front there. Um, but really what, what, uh, what happened was looking at combat experience uh, in the European theater uh, and, and the experience of the British against the ME109, uh, the, the Army Air Corps realized that this was not the design they wanted. And so... Um, as, uh, as Cart Belli said in his Life magazine interview, after the requirements of the war uh, were analyzed in actual combat, they wanted something completely different. So uh, the Army Air Corps stipulated that, that it had to use the R2800 air-cooled radio, uh, 2,000, power, 2000 horsepower engine, uh, massive piece of equipment, slinging a 12-foot propeller, and uh, really armor, speed, and self-sealing fuel tanks were, were more important uh, than its rate of climb or its maneuverability. Um, so they sacrificed rate of climb because it could get up to significantly higher altitudes. Uh, it took a while to get there, 
but with the R28, the, the turbo supercharged uh, R2800, it could get up there and it could stay up there and it could fight up there, uh, which were really key elements. So the uh, XP47B uh, was, they began construction on it in 1941, late 1941, uh, and it had its first flight on 6 May 1941. Um, and test pilot, Lauer Brabham, uh, took it up and uh, it actually caught fire in flight. Uh, the, there was oil uh, that mixed with the exhaust and so under the, uh, the aft fuselage here where the, the uh, turbo supercharger is, uh, it actually caught fire. Uh, however, he, he was determined to stay with the airplane and put it through its paces. And when he landed, uh, he was quoted as saying, I think we've hit the jackpot. Um, it was the first Army Air Corps airplane to, to exceed and, and sustain over 400 miles an hour in level flight, uh, kind of like the Corsair was for the Navy, uh, so too was the Jug, and amusingly, of course, they used the, uh, the same uh, power plant. So uh, Brabham was involved with the, uh, the, the test phase of the XP-47B uh, throughout its entire uh, entirety. And he, uh, he came up with a number of, uh, of issues uh, that needed to be resolved before it could actually go to, uh, into to squadron service. Uh, one of the things he realized, they realized was uh, at high altitude, the oil was actually boiling and, uh, because of less, less pre uh, air pressure, and he, he was losing oil pressure. So one of the things that they realized they could do is they, they rerouted uh, some of the bleed air from the uh, the compressor uh, from the uh, the turbocharger and pressurized the oil system, and that alleviated the uh, the problems of the oil boiling. Um, really uh, uh, genius, uh, you know, well, sort of figuring out what was wrong and correcting it. And uh, by early 1942, uh, they started uh, production of the P-47B and went into service by June of that year with uh, the 56 fighter group uh, in uh, originally Mitchell Field and then they moved up to uh, to Bradley Field in uh, Connecticut uh, fairly quickly after that. Uh, the 56th took the P-47B and put it through, it through its operational test phase. Uh, they recommended a number of improvements. One of the, the big issues was cooling. Uh, the engine was uh, was too close to the cockpit and a lot of the, that engine heat was radiating back into uh, into the cockpit. Uh, so one of the things they recommended was a, an extension on the fuselage uh, just in front of the firewall that uh, moved the uh, the engine eight inches forward, and that alleviated a lot of the uh, the cockpit heating issues. Uh, interestingly, of course, uh, they'd need a lot of that cockpit heat uh, operating at 36,000 feet over Europe, uh, but cockpit heating was actually fairly adequate uh, at, at that altitude anyway. Um, the P-47C was really the uh, the first type of the uh, Thunderbolt that uh, they took into combat. Uh, but the Army Air Corps realized that they needed, excuse me, by that time it was the Army Air Force. Uh, the Army Air Force realized that they were going to need a lot more fighters than just what Republic on Long Island could produce. And so they uh, opened up a second factory in Evansville, Indiana. Um, by uh, 7 April of, of 1942, uh, they began production. And so uh, P-47s uh, made at, uh, at Republic uh, Farmingdale were coded RE, so P-47D25RE, and their counterparts made at, uh, at, at Evansville would be P-47D26RA. So if you see an RA coded uh, serial number, it was produced in Evansville. Uh, Evansville produced over 6,000 P-47s uh, throughout the war. Uh, so just uh, about uh, about 3,000 fewer than they did at, uh, at Farmingdale. Uh, and they produced all uh, variants of the uh, of the P-47 from the uh, from the D onwards. Uh, so all Bs and Cs were made in Farmingdale, uh, Ds, uh, and, uh, and well, excuse me, D's and N's were produced uh, in uh, in Evansville. Uh, the M was strictly a, a Farmingdale product as well. 
So here we're going to take a quick look at, at what makes it tick. So the, uh, the turbo really, obviously, is, is the heart and soul of the, uh, the machine. And it's the reason why the, uh, the fuselage is so large. Basically, we've got all that duct work crammed into this fuselage. Uh, kind of makes it look a little bit like a milk bottle of the day. And so that is one of the uh, fabled origins of, uh, of the Thunderbolt's other nickname, the jug, because uh, it looked like a milk jug. Uh, the other, the second origin of uh, its nickname uh, was Juggernaut, uh, which is short for Juggernaut, uh, because it could take so much punishment and, and keep flying. So uh, if during this I keep referring to the Jug rather than Thunderbolt, I'm still talking about the P-47. Now, uh, the Jug went into combat uh, first with the 4th Fighter Group, who had been in England for quite a while already. They had uh, formed uh, as the RAF uh, Eagle Squadrons and flew Spitfires. And uh, they were very reluctant to take the P-47 on uh, as their new mount. They were used to the uh, sort of the sleek lines of the, uh, of the Spitfire and uh, the tiny cramped cockpit. Uh, of course, when, when the British Spitfire pilots first saw the, uh, the P-47, the rumored to have said that uh, you can actually get up and run around inside the cockpit uh, of the Thunderbolt if the enemy was shooting at you and, and dodge, uh, dodge them that way. Uh, it was a massive airplane, um, really uh, significantly larger than the Spitfire. And uh, so uh, they went into combat uh, for the first time with the 4th Fighter Group uh, in April of uh, 43. Uh, Colonel Blakesley, who was the, uh, the CO of the 4th, uh, scored the first kill in uh, in the Thunderbolt, uh, they shot down three FW-190s for the loss of two uh, Thunderbolts. Uh, and he uh, really was not impressed with the machine initially. Uh, he, he was quoted uh, as saying, it sure as hell better be able to dive because it can't climb. Uh, and that really was one of the major criticisms of, of the uh, Thunderbolt when it first came into combat. Uh, the propeller that it had initially uh, was a sort of a, a got the nickname the toothpick because it just did not have uh, a really good flying surface to, to bite into the air and pull the, uh, the Thunderbolt along. Uh, by early 1944, they had alleviated some of that uh, by introducing uh, three new types of propellers, which I'll get to shortly. Um, but Blakesley quickly did, uh, did talk about the airplane's uh, advantages too. Uh, it could dive like like nothing else. Uh, it could out-dive just about anything out there. Uh, it had an incredible rate of roll, uh, 
So it was, you know, it's, it, as long as you can get up to altitude and then uh, descend on German fighters attacking uh, the bombers you were exploring, uh, you were fine. Uh, and basically, bounce and zoom was the uh, the order of the day. If you're up high, come down, bounce the enemy aircraft, and then zoom climb back up to altitude so you can do it again. Um, it was known as a high altitude fighter, and uh, a number of the uh, well, both the the ME109 and the uh, FW190 performed better at, at lower altitudes. And so. Uh, another P-47 ace, uh, Colonel uh, Herschel Green, was quoted as saying, you know, don't get caught below 15,000 feet in a P-47, uh, especially if you know, you're in a maneuvering fight. Uh, now that, as the, uh, the Thunderbolt matured, uh, did change, uh, did become a very good out, low altitude uh, performer. Uh, but early on, it did have some, some issues there. Now, what the Army Air Force needed at the time was a long-range, high-altitude fighter. And unfortunately, the Thunderbolt only did one of those two things well. Uh, it was great at high altitude, but it had uh, not great range. Uh, it was only able to escort bombers to about the, the German border, maybe a little bit inside Germany, and then they had to turn around and come back. Uh, it, was, it was really limited as far as its combat radius, and it wasn't until um, later variants where they had wing pylons, uh, sort of the, the P-47D-15, that were plumbed for uh, external fuel tanks that they could go even further in. But by that point, uh, by the end of 1943, the P-51 was coming up. The P-51, of course, had the, the range to do it. Um, and uh, also, there was a change in command philosophy by the end of 1943, beginning of 1944. Uh, under General Aker, the uh, Eighth Air Force was had, had tied its fighters to escorting the bombers, and they were not allowed to to leave the es leave their escorts uh, to attack the Luftwaffe. And uh, in when uh, General Doolittle assumed command in uh, the beginning of 1944, he changed that attitude and, and basically said the, the number one priority of the 8th Air Force is to go after, uh, is to, to destroy enemy fighters. And so releasing the uh, the 8th Fighter Command to go hunt the, uh, the Luftwaffe really uh, changed the uh, uh, the game in, in Europe. Now, the Thunderbolt had a uh, major reputation for toughness. It could absorb a lot of punishment. Um, you can see a number of the, of the hits here. Uh, these are all flak hits as, as opposed to uh, uh, any air or hits from uh, aircraft, uh, machine guns, and, and uh, cannon. But the airplane could absorb a massive amount of punishment. Uh, and it was an excellent gun plan. Uh, it was great for, for both engaging uh, enemy aircraft and its 850 caliber machine guns would, would shred just about anything. Um, there have been a lot of, lot of uh, discussions over the years about whether cannon armed was, was better than, than machine gun armed. And uh, I would venture to say that, that the P-47 probably got the balance right with 850 caliber machine guns. It had a weight of fire that was basically the equivalent force of a locomotive hitting a dinner plate at about 3,000 yards. So just a, 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 an amazing amount of firepower, both against uh, air and ground targets. And it became the ace maker really quickly. Uh, of the top 10 aces in the European theater, seven of them flew uh, only the P-47. Uh, sorry, six of them flew only the P-47. Three more of them flew both the P-47 and the P-51. Only one of them, Ray Wetmore, only flew Mustangs. So I mean, it was really an ace maker uh, you know, as much as, as the, uh, the Mustang. Uh, in fact, the top scoring fighter group in the European theater was the 56 fighter group who flew the, uh, the Thunderbolt throughout the, entire, the in entirety of the war. Uh, Now, 
as uh, 1944 rolled on, it became clear that the uh, the invasion was was coming. And uh, in February and March, uh, both the Eighth and the newly reconstituted Ninth Air Force in England uh, began uh, using the P-47 as a uh, strafing platform. Uh, the, the first air-to-ground combat missions were flown in March 1944, and the intent was to really prepare the battlefield for uh, the invasion. Um, what they were going after were infrastructure, uh, so transportation infrastructure, rail railways, rail yards, uh, fuel depots, bridges, uh, all of those things that might assist Germany in reinforcing the invasion beachhead. Uh, now, at that point, the uh, I guess the, the most advanced version of the B-47 coming into uh, the continent was the D-15, which, as I mentioned earlier, had underwing pylons uh, installed from the factory, and they were plumbed both for uh, for fuel uh, for external fuel tanks and also uh, could carry bombs. And so uh, they began testing. The, uh, the Thunderbolt as a uh, as a dive bomber, uh, both in Europe and also in the Mediterranean theater. Um, it was an excellent gun platform, and very stable, and uh, of course, like I said, the, the weight of fire it could produce was devastating against gun targets. Now, one of the uh, major uh, criticisms of it was. Uh, was improved on fairly quickly uh, in, in the early months of uh, 1944. Uh, you can see here, we've got uh, basically a, a comparison of rates of climb uh, and the Thunderbolt is towards the bottom on uh, on just about all of these. It really was not a, a great uh, climbing airplane. Uh, the new Hamilton standard prop, and then there were two new types of paddle bladed Curtis electric props Increase that rate of climb by 800 feet a minute. Feet a minute. Uh, so definitely a major improvement in its combat performance. Uh, still not uh, equal to the Spitfire um, or the Mustang, but definitely uh, improved it significantly. Uh, one of the other improvements was uh, the was a, a field modification that the 65th Fighter Squadron in uh, the, the Mediterranean Theater uh, came up with. Um, Major Gil Wyman was the squadron commander, and he got with his uh, armament chief and said, look, you know, the way the bomb release handles are installed makes no sense. Uh, they were on the left-hand side, the, the floor uh, of the left-hand side of the cockpit, and you had to turn and reach down and pull the handles up in order to release your bombs. What he uh, and his, his uh, crew chief figured out, or excuse me, his armament chief figured out uh, was they could string up a, a system of pulleys and levers so that you can see in the photo here, there are two handles on the uh, the left side of the center console and one on the right. In a dive, now instead of shifting your focus to, down to the, to the left-hand side to pull your, uh, your handles, now all you need to do is run your hand up, reach the grab for those handles and pull them straight back towards you. So your attention's not shifted from the target and you're much more accurate. Um, they they actually uh, used it in combat fairly quickly after uh, they devised it, and it worked exceptionally well. Uh, worked so well, in fact, that by the the uh, time the D-28s were coming online uh, in in late summer of 1944, uh, this was standardized as uh, as the the new bomb release uh, mechanism. You see a little bit of Wyman in combat here. He's flying number 40. He navigates, makes the decisions, doesn't tell you what to do, does it? You follow, wingtip to wingtip. He turns, you turn. He climbs, you climb. Still, to ten 
thousand. Go to the clouds. Find a train. You spot one. Kick her over. Give it a few squirts. Might kill somebody. Bust the locomotive first. The train can't move now. Let's see what's in those box cars. No trouble here. You all crisscross in. Everybody takes a few passes. Try the cars one at a time. Might be something interesting to them. Usually is. Got it, Brandon? 
nice now. Huh? Take another pass. Oh, look. Flying. All right. So that was just a, uh, I guess, a typical uh, dive bombing mission uh, taken out of bridge in, in, in Italy. Um, one of the, uh, the criticisms of the jug early on was its visibility uh, out of the cockpit too. Great forward. Uh, you had two nice pieces of laminated glass coming together with, uh, with just a thin seam uh, in the front, but to the sides and to the rear, you had that big greenhouse canopy. Uh, so they pulled a P47D5 off the production line and cut down the, uh, the back of it, came up with a new windscreen and added a Hawker Typhoon uh, bubble canopy to it and came up with the XP47K. Uh, there were some initial stability issues because of the lack of, uh, of surface area on the rear fuselage, uh, but they, they alleviated that fairly quickly. Uh, and in, in fact, in, uh, in later model uh, bubble top, uh, P47s, you'll see there's a uh, fin fillet that they added uh, in front of the uh, vertical tail to, to further um, uh, adjust for that. Uh, but what the bubble canopy allowed was much, much better visibility to above, behind, and even down to the sides, because uh, the, the canopy bulged out, so you can actually stick your head into the, the bulge and see out over the wing and, and down forward uh, a little better. Uh, and really, this became the standard uh, as of the P47D25, uh, and the, that would be the D25, 26, 27, 28, and 30. Uh, those are the, the blocks that, that uh, served throughout World War II. So really, uh, starting in July of 44, uh, they started arriving in the European theater. And from then on, uh, the bubble top really uh, started to, to become the major Variant uh, used, although it never. Um, so yeah, uh, by uh, really the the uh, bubble top never completely replaced the uh, the Razorback uh, in service, uh, although it uh, it did become a much more common uh, airframe uh, as the war went on. Um, now, the uh, the Air Force roles uh, were still not fully decided by uh, the end of '43, uh, and that quickly uh, shook out uh, when, when Doolittle came on board. Uh, the ninth became the, the tactical air force uh, in, in uh, England, and the 12th became the, the tactical air force in, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, and they would, were uh, counterparts to the eighth, of course, in, in England, and 15th. Uh, and it was also decided at that point that the Thunderbolt would be the, the uh, Ninth Air Force would be Thunderbolt heavy, and the Mustangs would go to the Eighth Air Force. Uh, and similarly, in, in the, uh, the the 12th and 15th Air Forces, uh, the in, in England, the Ninth was never fully uh, a pure Thunderbolt uh, organization. Uh, there were three units that flew uh, the P-38 for quite a while before uh, two of them actually transitioned to the. Uh, uh, to the, the Thunderbolt one transition to the Mustang, uh, and then of course in the uh, uh, in the 15th, um, there were two Thunderbolt units that eventually, of course, uh, transitioned to the uh, to the P51 as well. Um, of course, the Eighth Air Force did retain one P47 group uh, throughout the entirety of the war, uh, the, the 56th. Although the 78th and the 353rd both tried to hold on to their their uh, Thunderbolts as long as they could, because they really did uh, did love them. Um, now the invasion was uh, really uh, ramped up the uh, air to ground role of uh, of the Thunderbolt. Uh, they had started air to ground ops in March, uh, and really were softening up the battlefield uh, from March until June, and June 6th, 9th Air Force flew nearly 2,200 sorties uh, in support of the invasion, uh, attacking anything that moved towards the beachhead. Uh, motor transport was completely paralyzed. Rail transport was completely paralyzed uh, because of marauding thunderbolts. Um, the following day, 7 June, they flew nearly 2,600 sorties. So even more once the, uh, the Allied armies were ashore and moving inland, uh, they were 
they were cooperating fairly closely with units on the ground that had gotten uh, uh, held up by German ground units. And uh, there were a number of, of incidents uh, on June 7th, uh, June 6th and 7th, where, where uh, Thunderbolts were uh, sort of the decisive factor in helping uh, move the Allied armies forward. Um, pretty much from that point on, the uh, the Thunderbolt was the fight, on call fighter bomb uh, that that uh, armament set to uh, to converge at 300 yards uh, was devastating, uh, and you can carry up to 2,500 pounds of ordnance. Um, you can see here the uh, 508 Fighter Squadron CO's airplane. He's got three 500 pound bombs on it, two under one under each wing, one under the center line. He's got four five-inch anti-aircraft rocket, or air, uh, what do you call it, uh, folding fin air, air, aerial rockets uh, for ground attack. Uh, each one of those rockets had the equivalent uh, uh, impact of 105 millimeter artillery round. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the 50 cals on board as well. Uh, ordnance was, uh, was quite varied. Uh, and they developed new, new uh, types of armament for the uh, the Thunderbolt to drop uh, during the uh, during the course of the war. Uh, they could carry up to a thousand pound bomb under each wing. They actually tried to uh, to figure out how to do a two thousand pound bomb under each wing because actually the jug could carry. Uh, the problem with the two thousand pound bomb, and this comes directly from uh, Colonel Van Sladen, who was the uh, commander of the thirty six fighter group. Uh, they they tried to, to rig them up. The, the mounting lugs on the 2,000-pound bomb were spaced differently than the 1,000-pound and smaller. And so when they tried to hook them on, on the uh, shackles on uh, under wing, they realized the rear one was too far back. So what they tried to do is strap them on. And uh, he relayed one, uh, one incident where they tried to take off with them, and the airplane hit a bump, and the straps broke. And so both bombs broke loose of their mornings and, and tumbled uh, tumbled down the runway. Uh, didn't really cause any damage because uh, they weren't armed, but uh, definitely was, was a tense moment. Uh, so really, a thousand-pound bomb was was the largest piece of ordnance that the Thunderbolt could carry. Uh, standard load quite often was two 500-pound bombs and a 260-pound M81 fragmentation bomb on the center line. Uh, and that's the first picture uh, at the, the top center there. Um, that's a 23rd Fighter Group airplane. Uh, next up uh, were, oops, sorry, yeah, that small uh, shot in the uh, in the corner there is an uh, M81 as well. Uh, and then one of the other standard uh, sort of uh, anti-personnel rounds was the uh, M41 cluster bomb. Uh, each one of these is a 20-pound uh, fragmentation bomb that would be mounted either under wing or under the center uh, center line. And uh, they were excellent against uh, troops in the open and light-skinned vehicles. Uh, napalm was developed specifically uh, during World War II for fighter bomber war. And uh, the Thunderbolt carried several different types of, of napalm canisters. Uh, the one in the lower right-hand corner there is a 165-gallon Lockheed tank. You can see the red uh, stripe around the nose of, uh, of the tank there. Uh, identifying that as a, a as a napalm tank rather than a fuel tank. Um, they would use standard fuel tanks and just fill them with napalm uh, and pop a fuse in, in, in the, them, which uh, when, they, uh, when the tank impacted, it would shatter and, and the, the fuse would go off and ignite the whole thing. Uh, they also carried rockets. And uh, on this, the center two shots here, you can see the triple bazooka tubes. You can also see uh, in the video clip uh, Gil Wyman's uh, P-47 had the, the uh, M8 triple uh, 4.5 inch rockets there. Uh, this shot here is interesting, interesting too, because not only does it have the rocket tubes, it's also got a 500 pound bomb and a 100 pound white phosphorus bomb strapped to the 500 pound. Uh, so really, this was uh, th this loadout. Uh, this is a 350th uh, fighter group airplane. Uh, was was uh, pretty nasty for. Uh, for uh, so probably uh, an anti-flak mission. Uh, the other rockets being fired here are five-inch uh, high-velocity aircraft rockets. Uh, those really came in towards the end of the war and were a significant improvement both over the M8 uh, tube-launch rockets and then the, uh, the five-inch uh, 
forward fire aerial, aerial rockets that you saw on the, uh, the airplane in the previous uh, uh, the previous slide. Uh, the H bars came out. Uh, it was actually a Navy uh, design weapon, uh, but it was a much had a much more powerful uh, rocket motor. Uh, the, the Mark Seven H bar, excuse me, Mark Seven uh, forward firing rockets uh, had an underpowered uh, three and a half inch motor uh, with a five inch warhead on it. Uh, so they tended to nosedive when they were fired. Uh, the five inch H bar corrected that and allowed for much, much more accurate rocket firing. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't really get to, to uh, Thunderbolt units until about February or, Mar or March of 1945. Uh, but they were excellent for uh, counter flak missions. Uh, and then the last uh, shot here we have, uh, sort of uh, jokingly said the kitchen sink, but uh, we were actually running out of uh, fuel tanks to use as napalm rounds uh, for P-47s. And so one of the things we started doing uh, as we captured German airfields, we started grabbing their fuel, uh, droppable fuel tanks and loading them with napalm and returning them to uh, to their original owners. So you can see that one uh, loaded here on a four or four fire. And P-47M uh, was the ultimate version of the, the uh, Thunderbolt that flew in, uh, in the European theater. Uh, it was the fastest piston engine aircraft of the war. Uh, topped out at 480 miles an hour, uh, just blistering speed. Uh, and they started uh, arriving in theater in uh, late November of 42. Uh, and they had the new uh, R2800C series engine. And, and it was basically just a P47 D30 uh, airframe, but it had this new engine on it that was significantly more powerful. Um, problem is, during transit, to uh, across the Atlantic, uh, the initial batches that were sent over were not adequate to water. And there were some issues uh, both with that, with corrosion inside the cylinders and uh, faulty wiring harnesses with uh, the earliest uh, M models that got into got to England uh, and a number of crashes resulted uh, due to engine failures. Uh, but they worked through them, figured out what was going on. And by February of 45, Really, the, the uh, P-47M uh, began flying combat missions uh, all the way into Germany. Uh, they would carry three 200-gallon uh, flat tanks uh, and be able to fly almost as far as a Mustang could. Uh, of course, if they had dropped the tanks before that, they wouldn't be able to, to get to that range. But the, uh, the M really was a, a much uh, a significant improvement over the first P-47s that were uh, flying escorts. Uh, in, uh, in 43 and everything too. Um, there's uh, a lot of a lot of great documentation on the 56th uh, actually coming, you know, breaking off from their escort missions and coming down and strafing German airfields. Uh, and I've been able to, to do quite a bit of research on that. A lot of, lot of uh, really uh, amazing documentation on just how effective they were, uh, not only as, as uh, escorts, but also now, the Pacific Theater, uh, the Thunderbolt had a significantly lesser role. Um, P-40 was, was really the, the main fighter that we had, uh, that the Army Air Force had uh, through the, uh, the first two years of the war. Uh, the 47 came in really in, uh, in the spring of 43, uh, just after they arrived in Europe. Uh, but because of its um, lack of range, it really never um, caught on in the uh, in the Pacific theater like it did in the, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, basically, as you're hopping from island to island across the Pacific, uh, range was everything, and, and uh, mission time was everything. And we had aircraft that that basically consumed less fuel, flew flew farther, um, or uh, and, and you know performed similarly. Uh, but five groups did fly the um, P-47D in the Pacific. Um, one squadron of the 49th a fighter group uh, did transition to the jug as well, but they eventually uh, completely converted over to the P-38, which two engines much more reliable over, over large uh, expanses of water. Um, P-38 really uh, was uh, the only, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the owner of uh, the Pacific theater. Now, it's not to say that the, the uh, 
the jug wasn't combat affected in the Pacific, because it certainly was. Uh, one of the great uh, actions that the uh, P-47 took part in uh, was on uh, the day after Christmas in 1944, uh, we had just taken the island of Luzon and the Japanese sent a naval task force to, uh, to attempt to retake the island. And uh, it was based around a heavy cruiser and had uh, seven other ships with it. And the only defense for, uh, for the island at that point was uh, a couple of fighter groups, uh, a reconnaissance group that had B-25s and the 503rd uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. And uh, they knew that the Japanese Naval, Naval Task Force was, was coming, uh, would get there around uh, nighttime. And so the 58th Fighter Group, along with the 8th and the, the uh, 110th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron, uh, took off to find this Naval Task Force and then attack it. Well, they had a limited number of bombs, so the B-25s uh, took all the bombs and the 47s and P-38s and, and P-40s all only attacked these ships with uh, um, with 50 caliber machine guns. The 58th would go back time and again once they found this, uh, this naval task force and strafe well into darkness. Uh, in fact, there's uh, mission reports saying that, that they could tell where the naval task force was by the fires. Uh, they completely shot out every single piece of fire control equipment on that uh, the Japanese cruiser Ashigara and uh, sunk one of the uh, the Japanese destroyers uh, through 50 caliber fire alone. Uh, of course, for the their actions there, uh, 58th uh, earned a distinguished unit citation. But the P-47 and well, excuse me, the P-47 wasn't done uh, being developed. Um, one of the issues, of course, was range. And so Republic redesigned the wing of the airplane to see how much fuel they could cram into. And they came up with the P-47N, uh, which entered service in late 44. And the N used the same engine as the P-47M with a newly redesigned wing with a significant amount, amount more fuel. And now we had a fighter that had Comparable, comparable range to the P-51, speed better than the P-51. It wasn't as fast as the P-47M, but it was only about a dozen miles an hour slower. Uh, so still really fast airplane that could carry an incredible amount of, of armor. Uh, so starting in April of 1945, uh, four groups started entering combat in the Pacific. Uh, the first was the 318th, which had flown P uh, P-47Ds in combat uh, through the, throughout uh, the Marianas. And uh, they uh, they were the first to transition. And then, of course, the uh, the 413th and 507 fighter groups uh, transitioned as well. Uh, and all three of those groups flew off of uh, the island of Aishima, uh, just off of uh, near, near Okinawa. And uh, they began flying strike missions from... Uh, basically over the uh, the Japanese home islands. Uh, the last group to convert was the 414th, and they actually flew from Iwo Jima and attacked the Japanese home islands. So basically they were flying 750 miles one way over open ocean to attack the Japanese mainland. Uh, it was the, really the, the P-47N was the first true strike fighter that uh, the uh, the Army Air Force uh, of the Air Force uh, used. Um, they could fly 2,500 miles uh, with, with external fuel tanks uh, and, and get to the Japanese home islands, loiter for, for some time, and then fly all the way back. Uh, it also had uh, new navigational equipment that allowed them to, to radio navigate over vast distances. Uh, the P-47N5 uh, which came in right at the end of the war, actually had an autopilot too. So you could basically trim up the airplane, set the autopilot, and, and uh, you know, stay on, on course, uh, on target. Uh, two P-47Ns could carry the same ordnance as a single B-17, and they could carry four more 50 cal uh, machine guns uh, than a B-17 could. Uh, so just a massive amount of ordnance, a very, very long way. 
and uh, really uh, was was greatly affected towards the, towards the end of the war. Now there are two Medal of Honor recipients that flew the P-47. Uh, the first being Colonel Neil Kirby, who was the CEO of the 348th Fighter Group in the Pacific. Uh, Colonel Kirby was the leading ace in the Pacific Theater for a fair amount of time. Uh, he ended up with 22 kills and he got earned the medal uh, in October of 1943 when he shot down six airplanes uh, on a single mission. Um, he uh, unfortunately was killed in March of 1944 during a dogfight uh, where he got down low and, uh, and maneuvered against a, a zero, uh, excuse me, not a zero, an Oscar and uh, ended up uh, getting shot down. Uh, then, of course, uh, in the European theater, or I should say the Mediterranean theater, we have Lieutenant Ray Knight, who uh, in April of 1945 uh, led a number of uh, strafing attacks on airfield, German airfields north of the Po River. Uh, by April of, of 1945, we pretty much pushed the, uh, the Germans all the way uh, north on the, uh, the Italian boot, and the re remaining Luftwaffe units were gearing up for a massive strike on uh, on our forces as they pushed northward. Uh, the 350th caught a number of these units as they were preparing to uh, to launch, and Knight was credited with destroying no less than 10 enemy aircraft uh, and damaging uh, 14 more. Uh, not only did he destroy and damage that many aircraft, but he continued to lead uh, his flight after uh, he was out of ammo and his aircraft was actually hit. And he continued to lead the flight down and, and until everybody's ammunition was expended. Uh, unfortunately, he continued to take hits. And as he peeled off to, uh, to head home, uh, his airplane was really starting to, to uh, lose uh, flight capability. And uh, as they were heading over the Apennine Mountains, um, his, uh, his airplane wasn't able to, uh, to maintain altitude. And he crashed, uh, and of course, was killed in the crash. Uh, so his actions there. Uh, really saved uh, a chunk of Fifth Army, and uh, so for his actions, he was uh, posthumously awarded the medal. So it's been said uh, that the jug, excuse me, that that uh, the Spitfire and the Hurricane held the line uh, during the Battle of Britain and really enabled the war in Europe to continue on. Uh, the Mustang, of course, took the fight to Germany, uh, but in the interim. It was the thunderbolt that really broke the back of the Luftwaffe, and in the same vein, you know, the uh, thunderbolt really was not considered a major factor in the Pacific Theater, uh, but the introduction of the P-47N uh, really gave Seventh and Eighth Fighter Command. Yes, Eighth Fighter Command was in the Pacific Theater by July of 1945, uh, and three of those four groups fell under the Fighter Command. Uh, but it gave them a, a long-range, flexible precision strike fighter. That had the war continued would have been a significant uh, factor in the uh, uh, defeat of the Japanese. So that's pretty much uh, all I've got at this point. Um, so I'd love to hear anybody's questions. John, if you want to keep it there on that last slide, I think it's uh, a good thing for us all to reflect on while we talk through the questions here. Sure thing. All righty. Um, so we do have a couple of questions here, uh, but first and foremost, I think. John, tell us more about the cockpit project you're working on there behind you. And it looks like you've got uh, a bunch of gauges in it. Are they all authentic P-47 gauges? They are. Um, in fact, it's missing two gauges right now. Um, one of them is the uh, airspeed indicator, uh, which happens to be extremely hard to find. Um, but uh, I'm looking for it. And uh, the other one, I actually just made a deal for it, is the, uh, the fuel gauge. Uh, because fuel gauges, of course, are specific to types of airplanes. So finding an original P-47 fuel gauge is really a hard thing to do. Uh, so I just found one. Uh, actually, a guy in Mexico had it. And I was and it will be arriving here shortly. But uh, I, I, I got this idea a couple of years ago um, to, to just get the fill the control panel. Uh, I happened to be at a military show in, uh, in Chickasha, Oklahoma. I was walking by a vendor's uh, table and they had this panel there. And I knew immediately what it was and it still had the tail number of the airplane on it and everything. So I know exactly where this particular bird was. It was a uh, uh, transition trainer in, uh, uh, in Texas. And uh, so I figured, okay, I'm just gonna fill the panel and that'll be complete. 
And so as I started looking for the gauges and everything, I started finding all of the other cockpit components. And so um, earlier this year, I had, to, I had a, a Ford GPW Jeep project that I had been working on for several years. And I realized that, that the Jeep was really cool and all, but I didn't want to, to it was a vehicle. It wasn't really where my interest was. My interest was, was in airplanes. And so I sold the Jeep and I figured, okay, I'm going to build a complete cockpit now, uh, just because I kept finding all these components. So I got the, uh, the windscreen first, and that is an original unissued P47D 20, uh, 28 windscreen. Um, and uh, I've got basically the entire uh, right side of the cockpit, uh, all the radio equipment, relay boxes and everything like that, all the microphone jacks. And, um, I've got the throttle quadrant right now. Um, I, I'm about to acquire a uh, control stick. And so I, I figure what better way to, to sort of get a feel of the P47 than to actually build the cockpit per the original drawings and everything. And, and now I'm going to be build, building it mainly out of wood uh, for all the, the uh, formers and everything, but uh, it will be skin in aluminum, uh, but just for ease of construction, what I can do in my garage with the wood. But uh, yeah, we're going to have an original P47 cockpit. That's a fantastic project. You mentioned finding um, finding your aircraft's tail number and that it was used stateside. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the training infrastructure that supported um, you know pilots learning to fly the P-47 and everything here in the states before they deployed? Where where were those bases concentrated? Uh, what did that training entail? They were all over. Um, the uh, let's see, uh, Mill, Millerville Millerville uh, Airport in uh, New Jersey was a P-47 training base. Uh, Bradley Field in Connecticut was a P-47 training base. Uh, this one was at, at uh, Matagorda Island down in Texas. Uh, so there were a number of, uh, of uh, transition training bases um, throughout the United States. Now, basically, your training pipeline was primary flight training, where you fly a steerman, into basic training, where you probably fly a BT-13 uh, Valiant, and then advanced flight training into the T-6. And then once you, you completed advanced flight training, you'd move on to transition training and fly the type of flight combat. Uh, so usually by the time pilots were done with their transition training, they had well over 200 hours uh, of flight time, uh, a, good, a good chunk of that uh, in um, in the type they were going to fly in, in combat. I believe about 120 hours um, was about the average for, for uh, fighter pilots um, heading overseas. Uh, and of course, once they got to their unit, they had some uh, additional training and familiarization before they were actually flying over the competitions. So one of the challenges that's often cited with operating the P-47 was its ground handling characteristics. Can you talk a little bit about what those challenges were and uh, what was done to overcome them? It, it handled fairly well on the ground, but with that massive R-2800 uh, in front of you, you couldn't see directly forward. Uh, so one of the, uh, the ways they would deal with that is you basically just make S turns uh, as you're uh, going down the taxiway. Better way to do that though is your crew chief would hop on your wing and fly out, uh, not fly, he'd uh, ride out on your wingtip and, and direct you as you're, uh, you're going down the taxiway. And, and once you got to the end of the runway, he would uh, get off and wish you, you know, good luck and you'd be on your way. Um, so uh, you know, the wide track landing gear really was, was great, especially, uh, you know, on, on landing. Um, you get a narrow track like in the Spitfire or the ME-109. They really uh, were, were uh, vicious when, when you first touched down. You could ground loop real easily. That widespread landing gear that the junk had really uh, made ground handling much better. John, you described the P-47N and its service kind of as a strike fighter in the tail end of the war in the Pacific. Was there ever an intention that it would escort B-29s or perform similar functions when it was designed? It did. Um, there were a few escort missions flown uh, by N models, um, mainly the 413th and the 507th, um, although actually the 318th did fly number one too. Uh, so, those three units really did fly a number of, uh, of a fair number of escort missions, but 
they weren't really needed. Uh, and the ability to, to carry that much ordnance to uh, the home islands and hit airfields that would have been trying to launch aircraft to engage B-29s was much more important than actually escorting the B-29s, which the Mustangs could. John, we've got a couple of folks listening who had family members that flew P-47s during the war. Um, can you describe the transition process of receiving new P-47s in the field and maybe upgrading from a P-40 or P-39 or something like that? Um, well, I know uh, a number of units did it. Uh, they would stand down uh, for a few days, uh, go through some some uh, classroom training on, on the aircraft, uh, usually, uh, not always, but sometimes the uh, the uh, Republic technical representatives would come out and talk about the airplane and, and, and how it handles, how it flies, et cetera. Um, other uh, methods, basically, uh, units that had flown them already uh, would come in and, and instruct for a few days uh, so they'd get familiar uh, in a sort of a rear area, for example, you know, in England, uh, as they transition, it was pretty easy. New airplanes would come in, pilots would, would get in the aircraft and, and get familiarization and go up and fly local over England rather than going across the channel. Uh, once once we uh, were, were across the channel and uh, operating it, you know, on the continent, uh, really only two of the P-38 groups, uh, the 367th and the 474th um, transitioned, uh, excuse me, no, sorry, 474th didn't, really only the uh, the 367th uh, transitioned to the, the jug and, uh, you know, they did it pretty much on the fly, you know, having flown P-38s from until February of 45, and then for uh, mid-February onwards, they just pretty much hopped in and went. So. Um, early on, you described a lot of the conditions that made it an excellent high-altitude performer. Um, mm -hmm. Were any of those systems deleted from the airplane as its role evolved throughout the war, or did they continue to be there? And and if so, how did they support its continued low-altitude operations? Uh, they did uh, retain it, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the supercharger, sorry, supercharger equipment. Um, in fact, you know, the, the supercharger equipment was improved steadily as the, uh, as the airplane was improved steadily. Uh, so the, the supercharger in the D30 was very, very different from the, the supercharger in the, uh, in the D1, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the uh, P47C or the D1. Um, they always had, uh, you know, wanted to, to have that high altitude capability uh, in case it was needed. Um, Ninth Air Force and 12th Air Force P47s tended to operate in the medium altitudes, but they did uh, occasionally escort B26s, uh, so they would need to get a fire. Um, wasn't a common occurrence, but it did happen. So they always you know, retained that capability. Okay. Um, the color footage you showed us, uh, just as a kind of courtesy to everyone else, that was from the film Thunderbolt, was it not? Yes, it was. Um, Thunderbolt filmed on Corsica in 19, in the summer of 44, uh, and it mainly focused on the 57th Fighter Group uh, flying missions, both over Italy and over southern France. And uh, it is available free for streaming on Netflix. You can watch a number of clips on YouTube as well. And curiously enough, the process of filming Thunderbolt uh, yielded color footage of our actual Spitfire MJ730 um, as a byproduct of that. So if you're super curious, uh, we do have a in our collection connection to, to some of what was discussed here this evening. Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about the Aztec Eagles, a Mexican Air Force unit that operated P-47s in the Pacific, sure. I think specifically in the Philippines, if that's something yes. you, well, you can share with us. The squadron. Um, yeah, they flew with both the uh, the 35th and the 58th fighter groups. Um, and yeah, they were a, a close air support ground attack unit flying P-47D-30s mainly uh, you know, in the, uh, the uh, latter half of 44 through, uh, through 45. Um, they were the the only uh, Mexican American or Mexican unit, should say, uh, Mexican unit uh, flying in the in the Pacific. Just like uh, in uh, Italy, we had the uh, first Brazilian fighter squadron flying P-47s uh, alongside the 350 fighter. Uh, so really, it was it was truly a, a multinational force, uh, both in the Philippines and in uh, uh, in uh, Italy. And 
John, as we're wrapping up here, um, would you tell us a little bit more about your books and, and where folks can find them? Uh, we've got a lot of questions about what are some great P47 references, be it, you know, reading material or, or things to watch. Obviously, Thunderbolt is a great thing to watch. Um, and your books are great things to read on the subject. Um, well, I've, I've done two books on the Thunderbolt so far. Uh, the first one was for Osprey's Combat Aircraft Series. And it's uh, P-47 Thunderbolt units of the 12th Air Force. And it focuses specifically on uh, jug operations in the Mediterranean. Um, and then uh, just a couple of years ago, I did P-47 combat missions for Elephant Books. And that is uh, all first person accounts. And uh, it's, it's a great uh, format. It's got a lot of uh, uh, memorabilia photos and, and, and first person accounts and some great original uh, photography. Um, so that, was, uh, that one was a lot of fun to do. Um, I can also recommend uh, Warren Bodie's uh, book Thunderbolt, uh, which really gets into a lot of the, the technical stuff um, down to when contracts were, were purchased and how many airplanes were in each production block and things like that. So that's, uh, that's really an excellent source. John, just to wrap us up here, um, obviously aircraft like the P-51 enjoyed a, a, an extensive post-war career. Uh, we don't hear quite as much about the P-47 and later F-47, though it did serve with guard units. Can you talk a little bit about why the P-47 was perhaps faster than the other airplanes in terms of fading into obscurity? The the jug stayed on in uh, Air Guard service until 1955. Um, now, there's been a lot of controversy over uh, the past decades about why we didn't fly P-47s in Korea. It's a much better airplane for, for air-to-ground work. We were, we were losing Mustangs uh, that were sort of pressed into that role and really not uh, made for it. Um, there are a couple reasons. Um, first of all, uh, we didn't have many P-47 or F-47s at that point uh, east of the Mississippi. There was only one unit, really, and that was the, uh, the 199th Fighter Squadron uh, in Hawaii. Uh, now, we could have shipped them to uh, to Japan and then on into, into Korea, uh, but there was an entire group's worth of Mustangs sitting there in mothballs in Japan already uh, from the United States. And so it was faster and cheaper to put them back into service than it would be to ship uh, Thunderbolts. Uh, but it, that was still, it was still possible to send the, the Hawaii unit. Uh, however, when you look at the, the economy of it, the the uh, P-51 used, or the F-51, I should say, uh, used about a quarter of the amount of gas that a, a jug would to do a comparable mission. Uh, it was, the, the P-47 was a massive gas guzz on the airplane. And so, while yes, it, it did perform better, uh, it could take more punishment uh, in the uh, low altitude mode. Uh, it was cheaper and easier to put the Mustangs in the service. Now, one of the other th things uh, we've looked at over the past several years is um, the Corsair and the Mustang in Korea. And the Corsair, you'd think, okay, it uses the same engine, uh, roughly the same engine as the Thunderbolt. It's got a lot of armor, and it was a great air-to-ground airplane. How did its loss rates compare to the Mustang? And we found that loss rates were really kind of comparable. So as many... Uh, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the numbers of Mustangs lost in combat and the numbers of Corsairs lost in combat are really very similar. So you can really extrapolate that maybe the Thunderbolt in combat in Korea wouldn't have been so much better uh, than, than the uh, Mustang. It probably would have had some advantage over it and maybe a slightly lower loss rate, but really, uh, you know, it, it probably using Mustang was, was uh, the right decision just because of uh, the logistics behind it. Well, John, thank you so much for your time this evening. That does bring us to the end of tonight's presentation. Uh, thank you again. Awesome. Thanks very much. We'll see you all next week. Again, thank you all for joining us this evening, and have a great rest of your evening.